Long thought of as a basal and aspid, Gemoitius is now recognized as the best known member of the Hyperoartian order Gemoidiaforms. In life, it resembled a lamprey with a very small mouth. Because the fossil had no teeth, teeth-like structures, nor suggestions of either in its mouth, it was not carnivorous like many modern lampreys. It was more likely to have been a filter feeder or a detritus feeder, possibly in the manner of larval lampreys. It is also the earliest known vertebrate with camera-type eyes. It also possessed weakly mineralized scales. Pharyngolepus had well-developed anal and caudal fins, but no paired or dorsal fins that would have helped stabilize it in the water, and so was probably a poor swimmer, remaining close to the sea bottom. The pectoral fins were instead replaced by bony spines, possibly for protection against predators, and there was a row of spines along the back. It probably scooped up food from the ocean floor. Intact fossil specimens of Burkinia elegans suggest the living animal reached a length of up to 10 centimeters, and was an active swimmer. The scales of Burkinia robusta differ from elegans in that, as the specific epithet suggests, the scales of the former are more robustly proportioned than those of the latter. Fossil specimens also show a rib that is modified by being narrow at the ends and gradually broadens and rises towards the middle of the scale, where a major elevation is developed that is expressed as a raised and slightly angled ridge. Arandaspis was about 15 centimeters long, with a streamlined body covered in rows of knobby armored scuts. The front of the body and the head were protected by hard plates with openings for the eyes, nostrils, and gills. It probably was a filter feeder. It had no fins, its only method of propulsion was the use of its vertically flattened tail. As a result, it probably swam in a fashion similar to a modern tadpole. Although it had no jaws, the mouth of Sacabambaspes was lined with nearly 60 rows of small bony oral plates which were probably movable in order to provide more efficient suction action through expansion and contraction of the oral cavity and pharynx. Its fossil shows clear evidence of a sensory structure. This is a line of pores within each of which are open nerve endings that can detect slight movements in the water, produced for example by predators. The arrangement of these organs in regular lines allows the fish to detect the direction and distance from which a disturbance in the water is coming. The specimen of Astraspis from North America is known to have had relatively large, laterally positioned eyes and a series of eight gill openings on each side. The specimen was generally oval in cross-section. The protective bony plates covering the animal were composed of aspidin, covered by tubercles composed of dentine. It is from these tubercles that the name Astraspis, literally star shield is derived. A pteraspidiform heterostracan has the cephalothorax enclosed in armor, formed from several plates. Many genera were benthic, others were apparently active swimming nectin. Delicate, Finger-like components of the anterior end of the ventral plate forming the edges of the mouth suggest that pteraspidiform heterostracans were filter feeders that selectively filtered specific sized plankton from the water column. Tenaspis has no adorbital opening and only two dorsal and ventral plates. 
the dorsal plate is fused with branchial and the plates notably thin. Tenaspis has its branchial openings located at the posterior edge of armor. The dorsal shield is flat. It was estimated, through observations of well-developed eyes of arthropod and vertebrate specimens recovered from the slate formation, that the water depth of the offshore environment where lived Drepanaspis was estimated to be rather shallow, only ranging from 40 to 60 meters in depth. It was based on these sedimentary observations that the conclusion of Drepanaspis having lived in shallow water environments. They were most likely nectabenthic, or bottom dwellers, a conclusion based on its flattened morphology and dorsal positioning of its oral opening. With information inferred from extant jawless fish species, it is a common feeding strategy for bottom dwellers to be bottom feeders, suggesting that it may have likely been a bottom feeder. Samalepes had a broad and flattened body which was almost as wide as it was long. This impressive width is owed to its extended branchials, which are large wing-like bony fins extending from the body. These branchials are so large that when measured for the amount of lift they can produce, its lift-to-drag ratio is comparable to that of a jet airplane. This lift force would provide Samalepes with an efficient cruising ability while reducing maneuverability. This suggests that it was effective at exploiting widely distributed food sources, possibly plankton in the water column, or at escaping predation. Due to its unusual form, Doriaspis ecology is debated. There are two hypotheses about lifestyle, to make it a surface pelagic swimmer or a benthic burrower. For pelagic lifestyle, it mostly used its caudal fin to move. Fin-shaped plates may have effect of levitation by increasing the bearing surface of it. Water flows ejected by their gill openings may work to stabilize and control lateral movements. On the other hand, benthic burrowing hypothesis is supported by its flat dorsal disc. Moving half-buried in the sediments allows it to filter nutrient particles. Like other heterostracan fishes, Teraspis had a protective armored plating covering the front of its body. Though lacking fins other than its lobed tail, it is thought to have been a good swimmer thanks to stiff, wing-like protrusions derived from the armored plates over its gills. This, along with the horn-like rostrum, made Teraspis very streamlined in shape, a perfect quality for a good swimmer. Rhinopteraspis had some stiff spikes on its back, possibly an additional form of protection against predators. It is thought to have fed from shoals of plankton just under the ocean surface, and some records are found in association with marine fossils, while some others are found in freshwater environment. Peturiaspis vaguely resembled the Osteostraci, though neither are considered to be close relatives. The head shield extends posteriorly to form a long abdominal division which probably reached the anal region. The dorsal portion of its head armor differs from Osteostracans in that the orbits of the eyes are set apart from each other, and that the shield has no pineal foramen, and that an opening at the base of the rostrum gives very little hints about the nature of the nasal openings. Galeaspida is an extinct taxon of jawless marine and freshwater fish. The name is derived from galea, the Latin word for helmet, and refers to their massive bone shield on the head. They lived in shallow, freshwater and marine environments during the Silurian and Devonian times in what is now southern China. T. Air most distinctive feature was a single large opening on the upper side of their head shields, and despite looking like a particularly goofy mouth this hole was actually a nostril, used for both a sense of smell and as a water intake for their gills. The actual mouth and the gill openings were on the underside of the head. Tridonaspis hasn't the most extremely pointy of its kind, but still had a weird kite-shaped head shield, 
a long vertical slit-shaped nostril opening, and rather large upwards-facing eyes. The opening on the head of Eugaliaspes and other Galeaspida appears to have served both the olfaction and the intake of the respiratory water similar to the nasopharyngeal duct of hagfishes. Galeaspids are also the vertebrates which have the largest number of gills. The body is covered with minute scales arranged in oblique rows and there is no other fin besides the caudal fin. According to the researchers from the Institute of Vertebrate Paleontology and Paleoanthropology under the Chinese Academy of Sciences, they named the new species as Foxaspis because its caudal fin is comprised of nine ray-like scale-covered digitations, just like that of the nine-tailed fox, a mythical animal from an ancient literature Shan Hai Jing. They discovered that galeaspids may be active swimmers, and can make good use of muscle contraction to control the contact area between tail and water flow, thus generating different thrust forces. Like other jawless fish, Polybranchiaspis did not possess true jaws. Instead, it had a circular mouth lined with small, pointed structures used for feeding on small invertebrates and detritus. It inhabited ancient marine environments during the Silurian period. At that time, Earth's oceans were populated by various marine life forms, including trilobites, brachiopods and other early vertebrates. Due to the scarcity of fossils and research attention compared to other prehistoric organisms, Sanchaspes remains relatively less studied in comparison to some other genera. However, while it may not be as well documented as some other prehistoric organisms, it is an important part of the puzzle in reconstructing the evolutionary history of vertebrates. The exact causes of the extinction of the Galeaspida and other marine life during the late Devonian extinction are still a subject of scientific investigation. It is believed to have been a combination of several factors, like climate change, ocean anoxia and competition with other more advanced jawed fish that were becoming more prevalent during the late Devonian may have also played a role in their decline. Furcicotiform are noted as having a laterally compressed body, large anterior eyes, slightly posterior, lateral and vertical to a small mouth, and a condensed curved row of branchial openings directly posterior to the eyes. A large square cavity within the gut connecting a small intestine to an anal opening led many to believe that it is this genus that exhibits the first vertebrate stomach. According to Wilson and Caldwell their discovery, based on sediment infillings of fossils of the Furcicotta, gives credence to the evolutionary development of stomach before jaws. Thelodonts are united in possession of thelodont scales. This defining character is not necessarily a result of shared ancestry, as it may have been evolved independently by different groups. Thus, the thelodonts are generally thought to represent a polyphyletic group, although there is no firm agreement on this point. On the basis that they are monophyletic, they are reconstructed as being ancestrally marine and invading freshwater on multiple occasions. Most thelodonts were considered deposit feeders, but more recent studies have shown that several species were active swimmers and thus more pelagic. A large variety of species in particular preferred reef ecosystems. They are mainly known from open shelf environments, but are also found nearer the shore and in some freshwater settings. The appearance of the same species in fresh and saltwater settings has led to suggestions that some thelodonts migrated into fresh water, perhaps to spawn. Dartmuthia is one of the only osteostracans in which material of the trunk and tail behind the armored head shield have been found. Since the mouth is positioned on the underside of the head Dartmuthia is presumed to have dwelled on the ocean floor, sucking its food into its mouth. Tremataspes was about 10 centimeters in length, and had an armored shield covering its head. 
Compared with its relatives, the shield was unusually elongated, covering the whole front of the body, and was more rounded in shape. It is thought that it used its rounder shield to burrow in the ocean floor, searching for food. Because the shield consisted of one solid piece, it probably did not grow during the animal's life, presumably, the larvae lacked the shield, which only appeared later in life. Anatomically speaking, the osteostracans, especially the Devonian species, were among the most advanced of all known agnathans. This is due to the development of paired fins, and their complicated cranial anatomy. The osteostracans were more similar to lampreys than to jawed vertebrates in possessing two pairs of semicircular canals in the inner ear, as opposed to the three pairs found in the inner ears of jawed vertebrates. Hemicyclaspis had a heavily armored, shovel-shaped head shield. It is thought to have been a better swimmer than most of its relatives because of its powerful tail, stabilizing dorsal fin and the keel-shaped hydrodynamic edges of its head shield. It probably foraged the ocean floor for food. Most osteostracans had a massive cephalothorax shield, but all middle and late Devonian species appear to have had a reduced, thinner, and often micromeric dermal skeleton. This reduction may have occurred at least three times independently because the pattern of reduction is different in each taxon. Because its mouth was situated directly beneath its head, Cephalaspis was thought of as being a bottom feeder, akin to a heavily armored catfish or sturgeon. It moved its plow-like head from side to side, it easily stirring sand and dust into the water, along with revealing the hiding places of its prey, digging up worms or crustaceans hidden in the mud and algae, as well as sifting through detritus. It had sensory patches along the rim and center of its head shield, which were used to sense for worms and other burrowing organisms in the mud. These fishes were probably relatively good swimmers, possessing dorsal fins, paired pectoral fins, and a strong tail. The shield of bone covering the head formed a single piece, and so presumably did not grow during adult life. However, the way in which the bone was laid down makes it possible to examine the imprints of nerves and other soft tissues. This reveals the presence of complex sensory organs and the sides and upper surface of the head, which may have been used to sense vibrations. Species of Boreaspis were very small, with head shields about 2 cm long. All species possessed a long spathe-like rostrum derived from the anterior most end of the head shield, which would have enhanced the fish's hydrodynamics and was probably also used to root out food buried beneath the substrate. <laughs>